Hello bad company, I am back. For those who don't know, I have just been off sick for a couple of weeks. During this time, I couldn't record any voiceovers, but I was able to play through the Bioshock trilogy. After a combined 35 and a half hours spent fighting through the underwater tunnels of Rapture and floating city of Columbia, I found myself wondering how many elements from these games would be a good fit in Fallout 76. In the end, I came up with five features from the Bioshock franchise, which I believe would vastly improve Fallout 76. The first of these is the research camera. The ProSnap Deluxe camera came to Fallout 76 on April 23rd, 2019, and I for one was not a fan. That's right, the wieldable camera in Fallout 76 sucks. I said it. You might be thinking, but Sarge, you love taking pictures and video games. After all, you sometimes share video game snapshots on your Twitter account, at Bad Company Sarge, and every month you make custom wallpapers from your photo mode images for all of your patrons over at patreon.com forward slash Bad Company Sarge. And to that I would say, first off, thanks for plugging both those things. Saves me from having to do it. And secondly, yes, I love photo modes and games, which is precisely why I despise the Fallout 76 camera so much. Fallout 76 has the best photo mode in any game I've personally played. It has a wide variety of options, is easy to use, and can get great quality pictures thanks to its perfect balance on these two fronts. The Pro Snap camera on the other hand is best used as a prop to get someone else to hold while you actually take the time to get a good shot of them through the standard photo mode. The Pro Snap is a terrible choice for taking good photos in the game but players do often use it for identifying corpses thanks to its special HUD. But that's a pretty bleak fate to befall a device with so much more potential. In Bioshock and Bioshock 2, you gain access to a research camera, a weapon which doesn't deal damage, but instead allows you to take photos or videos of your enemies in order to learn new abilities, unlock powerful upgrades, and deal bonus damage to the enemy type. 76 could do something similar. Take enough high quality pictures of a Deathclaw, and take 10% less damage from the melee attacks. Snap a herd of radstags, and maybe they flee less often. And film a Scorch Beast taking flight, and Todd Howard personally phones you to request you buy another copy of Skyrim, this stuff is so straightforward that the effects basically invent themselves. There is an issue of this system becoming a tad too powerful though. The Bioshock games are fairly short, taking about 10 to 15 hours for most players to beat. Fallout on the other hand, well I'm already well over the thousand hour mark. Permanent buffs work fine in a short game. They make the final boss a little easier, and reward you for completing additional activities. In a constantly evolving game though, permanent buffs can quickly end up stacking on top of one another, and creating a dangerous power creep, making high level players omnipotent gods who never get to face a true challenge unless the devs turn up the game difficulty to such a degree that more casual players are left feeling worthless in most fights due to the high power disparity. God, that sentence was too long when I wrote it and I'm still kind of ill. For this reason, I'd like to see these buffs as temporary, maybe lasting a maximum of 24 hours. In my eyes, this is a long enough buff time that even small boosts will still be worth getting if you know what type of enemies you'll be dealing with as you play. If you plan on exploring the burrow soon, then take a photo of a ghoul as part of your prep, and then you no longer take radiation damage from them. Going to West Deck for some levels, film a super mutant, and have a bonus to sneaking past them for the next day. If these bonuses were just for an hour or two, they'd still be desirable at times, but I feel that making them last a full day of real world time would help to promote everyone to use the camera more often, not just for high level players looking to stack every buff possible in order to one shot every boss. On to our second idea that 76 can take from Bioshock, that being the little ground arrow quest marker thingies from Bioshock Infinite. These are arrows which show up on the ground after holding a button, and help guide you to your current objective. As soon as I saw these, my mind jumped instantly to Vans, the first intelligence perk in Fallout 4. Back in that game, the perk wasn't particularly desirable, as spending a valuable perk point on a bonus quest marker was rarely as helpful as being able to knock down foes with power armor, or summon the mysterious stranger. In Fallout 76, situational perks hold far greater value though, thanks to the perk card system. You can swap in or out perk cards whenever you want, and these cards are earned on a very regular basis. Plus, once you reach a high enough level, you have every single card unlocked, so it's not like you're going to be short on perk points. By throwing this in as a basic 1 rank intelligence perk card, you could help out plenty of new players with guiding them through an incredibly open world, 
and help people like myself who find it very easy to get lost inside of buildings and have to cut 20 minutes out of every other Let's Play episode because interior quest markers don't work well, especially in multi-story buildings. This idea may be incredibly easy to implement, or I may as well be asking the dev team to pay you every road with caps. My job isn't to know how to code the game though, it's to make YouTube videos about this game, so don't think this is the last you'll hear of me talking about Vans in 76. I've got a whole playlist of perk cards I want to see in the game, and those videos are incredibly fun to make, so you know you better subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the inevitable video where I showcase that card. After those first two points, Bioshock stands are probably getting worked up that my takeaway from the series is only touching on gameplay, rather than the great philosophical points, the complex characters, and incredible storytelling of the franchise. That or they're prematurely defending the choice to have heavy drill on monsters as guardians of an unstable underwater fishbowl. To which I say, no. Big daddies are exactly what people heading down to Rapture need to see. After all, any idiot who decides to live in an underwater city probably needs to physically see a giant drill arm to realise just how screwed they are. Anyway, we're done with the gameplay-centric stuff and instead are going to focus on those other three points, starting with the complex multi-layered characters. The Bioshock games have some great characters, but in the interest of keeping things brief, we're going to focus on Elizabeth, the main NPC from Bioshock Infinite, who acts as your companion throughout most of the game. The story revolves around her, so I can't just say, hey Bethesda, make an Elizabeth for your game, as 76 can't be focused around a single NPC. Although, as I say that, I do recall that the main story is essentially just doing everything the Overseer wants you to do, but that comparison also highlights a big reason why 76's characters are pretty lacklustre for the most part. They're more plot points than people. Elizabeth appears to be a somewhat naive and deeply caring woman towards the start of Bioshock Infinite, but as the game progresses, you see a darker side of her, as she goes to some extreme lengths to secure her freedom or stand by her own moral code. The Overseer, on the other hand, gets a little sad when Arevahov turns into a Scorched and hints at a dark past, but most players feel nothing towards her. If the Overseer died in the very next update, I would not care one bit. Despite being one of the main NPCs, she's just not a character I have any real reason to be invested in, and I doubt many of you care about her either. So how do we improve this current standing through what we find in the Bioshock games? First is to give your characters a clear goal to work towards and explain why they want to achieve said goal. Elizabeth wants to go to Paris. Why? Because she spent her entire life trapped inside of a tower so has a great drive to explore the places she's only read about in books. It's a realistic goal which Elizabeth takes actions to achieve, and these moments help build her character. The Overseer wants to get the gold from Vault 79 in order to establish a new currency, so she sends you off to do the entire Wasteland questline with very little input from her during it. This isn't a goal that the character achieves, but is more akin to a manager delegating a work task to a subordinate, and then never coming back to check on how things are. Instead, the writers could expand upon this goal, to be just the start of what the Overseer could really be looking for. Maybe she craves the world to return to how it was long before the bombs dropped. Perhaps she's ashamed of her time with vault -Tec, misses the life she left behind, and therefore will try to rebuild West Virginia to be how it was before. Put some real emotional depth behind this. Show the Overseer crying over a picture of her lost love, and leave hidden notes around her house where she questions the path she chose. This kind of thing would take a lot of time spent planning and some people doing great character writing, and that kind of thing can't just be patched in on a whim. So how about some easier, cheap tricks to get people to like characters? In Bioshock Infinite, Elizabeth will help you out in a few different ways as you play the game. She can summon you useful environment objects, consumables, or ammo. Booker, cash. Thanks. And she will point out useful items or strong enemies during combat. In real life, if you help someone out, they're much more likely to have a positive view of you, and this applies the same to video game characters. When NPCs give us items, help us out in tricky fights, or just speak kindly to us, we're more likely to care about them. With Fallout 76, I'd recommend a focus on gifts and nice words, as NPCs in combat are virtually worthless right now. We already have allies in our camps who will reward us for doing a quest for them, but why not have them occasionally give us a gift as well? When they mention a merchant stop by, they could also say, I got a few things you might like, and they reward you with a bit of junk to help build up the place, ammo for your guns, or just something to help endear them further. Depending on your reputation and who you side with in Vault Heist, maybe the settlers or raiders are more inclined to give you gifts as well, or a party could show up when you're in a tough fight to help you out. 
make it so that when you're fighting alongside NPCs, they act more as support instead of making them the world's weakest mobile turrets. Have them run over and revive you if you go down. Mark targets in the same way a recon scope would, or maybe have them throw you a mag of ammo when they arrive. These won't cause the same bond as a well-written character, but it works as a quick way to make a mass of characters likeable, and then the more fleshed out characters can be limited to a small number of individuals which get to play pivotal roles in the story. One of the reasons that the characters in Fallout 76 are a bit lacklustre is that it's a multiplayer game where the focus is to go hang out with friends and just complete a bunch of repeatable activities. But just because that's the focus doesn't mean you can't still have hard-hitting narrative moments, and when it comes to these, Bioshock is a great place to look. After all, the first game initially became famous thanks to the Would You Kindly twist and the A Man Chooses a Slave of Bay scene. These are moments where the individual playing the game is doing nothing but watching it as a cinematic place. Sometimes it's better to take control away from a player and just let them focus all their attention on what's happening. Pivotal story moments shouldn't be spent with the player searching through desks to see if anyone left a few caps behind. The end of a Wastelanders questline is you having a short chat with everyone about how you're going to split up the gold reserves. As the new main story of the game, it's kind of a disappointing end. Why not instead end things with an old school Fallout endgame cinematic, showing the side you went with gaining power due to this new currency, hinting at future conflicts over the gold, and congratulating you on your achievement. Sure it's no would you kindly, but it packs far more of a punch than here's some gold bars, how do you want to split them up? Anyway, it's about time to move on to our final point, make Fallout 76 an actual dystopia. The first two Bioshock games take place in Rapture, an underwater city where the vast majority of the residents have been murdered, gone mad, or changed into monsters. Rapture took inspiration from the horror genre, granting the game a dark aesthetic, with potential threats lurking around every corner. The unsettling atmosphere means that you can never feel comfortable in the city, as you must be ready for whatever it might send your way. On top of that, the Little Sisters work as a morality system, which gives you an immediate reward for doing the reprehensible of the two actions, harvesting a child in order to increase your own personal power. Columbia, the floating city-state in Bioshock Infinite, does not have the same dark aesthetic, instead actually being quite a bright and beautiful place to live, at least at first glance. It doesn't take long for the city to reveal its dark side though, quickly showing the elite residents to be made up of racist ultra-nationalists who zealously worship their founders, and who I didn't hesitate to murder at every opportunity I had. Where the first two games reinforce the dystopian nature with the game's dark aesthetic, Infinite manages to make an equally disturbing environment by contrasting the beauty and splendour of Columbia with its evil inhabitants and worldview. Both of these games create compelling dystopian worlds for the player to explore. Fallout 76, on the other hand, seems to fall short on this front. For a game set just two and a half decades after the world was devastated with nuclear war, 76 is surprisingly pleasant, and dark moments are very few and far between. This isn't something all that new to the Fallout franchise, though. I personally feel that Fallout 3 was the last game that felt dystopian. New Vegas and 4 both had their dark sides, but ultimately their worlds are ones where the inhabitants have built themselves up to live relatively happy lives. Sure, there are dangerous places in the world, and evil is always somewhere out there, but neither game takes place in a dead or dying world. The same is true of 76. At the very start of the game, you're told that your purpose is to go out and rebuild West Virginia, a state that was relatively spared from the wrath of Armageddon. Add in the fact that it's a multiplayer game where users can dress up in a pink cow costume and bunny hop around everywhere, and you've got yourself a product which really doesn't lend itself all that well to a dark and gritty telling of the horrors of nuclear warfare. The Bioshock series shows us that you can make things dark and dim, all bright and beautiful, while still presenting the player with a dystopian world, so Fallout should have no trouble being a more bleak game. Maybe it's for the best that it isn't though. The real world feels dystopian enough at times, and maybe Fallout 76 shows us that things can get better, even after the worst of times. And there we have what Fallout 76 can learn from Bioshock. This video is one I was so excited to work on, but I've actually been writing this script while still sick, and you might be able to tell, thanks to my voice, that I'm not fully recovered, and uh, when I talk too long, <laughs> this is what happens. Yeah, stay safe out there, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed watching this as much, and ideally more than I did making it, 
and if you did, why not leave a like on the video? As a special thank you for making it to the end of this, I want to let you know that I have some new Bioshock Infinite wallpapers available on my Patreon page. They're completely free to grab, just like my previous Bioshock and Borderlands 2 wallpapers. You don't have to become a patron for them, just head over to patreon.com forward slash badcompanysarge and download them. As for my patrons themselves, a huge thank you, as without whom I'd be having a far rougher time, so round of applause to them. I'll just assume you all paused the video to do that. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching. Sarge out.